Rock and roll. Can we also do a real quick, I'm gonna jump out of the light here to, to highlight our subliminal messaging. Why? It's a little bit bigger than the rest. Why are you here? <laughs> this, this was very intentional. This, this was very intentional. Um, what are you doing? Why are you here? Uh, we thank Jimmy. I also wanted to do a quick thank you right at the top. Uh, Santa Clara, TEDx Santa Clara University. Thank you for making this all possible. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. <sighs> Ideas worth spreading. I love this energy. I love it. I love it. Um, but to jump right into the, the elephant in the room, Time to transfer, folks. This was nice, this was great. But can I get a, a quick show of hands? How many people here have ever considered transferring from anything? Job, relationship, school, anyone? Woo, good stuff. I love the, the folks in there not raising their hand. They're like, nope, my life is great. My life is excellent, thank you. Good, congrats, bye-bye. Um, <laughs> no, no, kidding, kidding. But I think we can all say We've been somewhere like that, that uncomfortable feeling of, is this right? Is something wrong? Could something be better? And I don't know about you, but in those moments, those kind of questions, I start to feel a little bit like this. Ah! Uh, this is uh, Edward, Edvard Munch's 1893 uh, painting titled The Scream. My parents and I have uh, affectionately retitled it The College Board. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, they are good people doing bad things. No, also, <laughs> kidding, kidding again. But in moments like this, in moments of crisis, I start to look for things that feel good, a way to not feel like this. So, naturally, mm -hmm. my sister is a great human being, excellent cook. One wrinkle dinkle, though, during the application process, thank you, folks, it's a fun phrase, um, <laughs> She replaced the salt in the sugar. So when the recipe called for sugar, she actually put in salt. Um, four dozen cookies later, she tries one and was like, whoa, no. I, however, in this state, tried one and thought, hmm, ode to the ocean. Hmm, maybe, maybe needs a little bit more chocolate chips. I'll try another one, tried another. 36 cookies later, I kind of got the point and called it a night. Unfortunately, with enough of a sodium spike that I actually passed out that night. <laughs> yep, and realized a very important lesson. That in moments of crisis, in confusion, in lack of purpose or clarity, we look to defend and to satisfy ourselves. Right? In moments of crisis, we defend numero uno, which is an excellent evolutionary trait, but very difficult and challenging when we're trying to innovate, inspire, and grow, right? <laughs> a little precursor. Um, I tell this story, I tell this story because I found that I started to do that same thinking process when I came to Santa Clara. I got to Santa Clara and something felt off. Something felt a little salty, if you will. Um, and I was told time and again that the opportunities here were great, that I could make it happen, that I could be happy, that I could make it home if I just, if I did enough. So I added activities, relationships, friends, clubs, sports. I kept adding, eating, consuming, assuming that it would make me happier until, like we saw, my college experience started to look a lot like this. Welcome to Santa Clara University, home of Drew's needs. <laughs> home of Drew's needs, concerns, anxieties, lack of purpose, lack of clarity. And I realized that this wasn't satisfying. So it was in this state that I started reading the work of a uh, Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, who talks about doing. Whatever it is that you're doing, do it. If you're washing dishes, wash dishes, <laughs> right? Right, if you're uh, talking to a friend, talk to your friend. If you're going to the bathroom, go <laughs> to the bathroom, right? If you're eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I don't know if you know, but the sandwiches at Lucas Hall are spectacular. I grabbed one, I sat down, and I decided to eat it as slow as I could. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Have you ever thought about how the tangy sweetness of strawberry jelly complements perfectly the nutty creaminess of peanut butter? How the texture of the strawberry seeds is accentuated by the butteriness of the peanut butter? Oh 
my gosh. I was sitting in Lucas Hall, blown away by the sandwich. I love the other business students walking by. They're like, wow, half past nine, he's already high. I was like, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm not high. I'm, I'm not high, it's a sandwich. It's a sandwich, no, no, <sighs> slow. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good day, real good day. Um, but I realized it wasn't just a sandwich, I had tasted reality. Ooh, I promise, not high, again. Um, but I had tasted reality. A quick question, which one is real, the individual or the forest? You guys are so smart, trick question, they're both real. But this is where the eighth grade student starts. Starts learning about the individual tree and how xylem and phloem work together to bring solar energy from a giant ball of gas that we're spinning around. Somehow takes that energy and mixes it with water and dirt stuff, a technical term, use it carefully. Um, mixes it to make life? Oh my gosh. And yet somehow, when we begin to multiply it, when it doesn't offer ethernet or Wi-Fi, it suddenly becomes less important. In, in economics, we, we understand that as something increases in abundance, the individual value decreases. That works on an economic scale, but it's not true of reality. It's not true of reality. Someone that has a great pulse on reality is Louis C.K., who talks about people that come to him complaining about their airplane flights. Oh my gosh, Louis, we waited forever. It was 20 minutes in the terminal, then 40 minutes on the tarmac, and then... And then what? And then did you fly through the air like a bird? <laughs> did you participate in the miracle that is powered flight? You, you were in a chair in, in the sky, you non-contributing zero. That was, sorry, that was Louie, that was not me. You're a great audience, I love you all. But isn't he right? Everyone on the plane should be sitting there going, oh my gosh, ah, put your hands up. Oh, it's happening, it's happening. Right, but they'd call you because you're high again. No, no, it's reality, it's reality. Seeking reality and still feeling confused, I spent four days on my own in silence in the woods near our home. Also, again, not high, I promise, I don't, <laughs> none of that. But I was curious that if life is like this, what does it look like to sit with reality, to explore, to experience, and to feel? I actually climbed a tree at sunrise and I sat there for the whole day. I climbed down at sunset and while I was sitting there, I found that if you actually pay attention to parts of your body, you have enough nerve cells to recognize your own heartbeat. You can recognize your own heartbeat in different parts of your body and you can let that awareness move from your feet up through your body, your core, your chest, your arms, up to the, the carotid artery pulsing, pumping life, up to your head. It's amazing and if you allow it to expand even further, you realize that your body is constantly pulsing and it's amazing and I got bored. I started to think about my family and I started to look forward to being home to fix the things that seemed off, to, to give and to reconnect and to do the things that matter. And I loved sitting in the tree, but it felt like life, life was more. And this concept is captured by a gentleman named Wallace J. Nichols who, who wanted to study the fact that why is it that unless you've had a traumatic ex experience, the vast majority of people love the ocean, feel good near the ocean, statistically, that's pretty remarkable. So he studied the physiology and found that the human reaction to awe, to the ocean, to something bigger than ourselves, the human instinct in these moments is gratitude, which leads to self-gift. We as human beings recognize on a physiological level that in moments of awe, in moments of gratitude, we wanna give ourselves away. And this is not just true in nature. I got off the phone with my sister after forgiving her for the cookies. Um, and I got off the phone. I was getting ready for class and I jump in the shower and I, and I start to cry. Just overwhelmed. We're, we're very close and overwhelmed by the privilege it is to be her brother, to have the relationship that we do. And, and as I'm thinking about this, the crying is getting worse and, and there's shampoo and there's snot and it gets to that, you know, that gross cry that none of us admit to do, but it's just everywhere, right? And my poor roommates, you know, it's not a loud shower. I can't imagine what they, 
we're hearing. Um, <laughs> but, but it's moments like that that are not just, it's a disgusting kind of beauty. It is a disgusting kind of beauty and also something that I like to call an inarticulation indication. Those moments when words don't seem to fit what we feel, don't seem to capture the gratitude that is expanding outward. That is inarticulation, an inarticulation indication that we're getting close to the good stuff, right? And in this world, this age of the individual, we run the risk, we gamble the right to feel small. We run the risk of losing opportunities to put ourselves in positions, in opportunities, in spaces that remind us that our reality is insignificant, that our reality is small, that it can humble us and delight us and put us in some of the most creative spaces possible. Because I think we can all agree it's in those moments, those moments of, of sobbing, of awe, that we are our most creative. We are entitled to nothing, humbled by all, and we walk the world as if we owed it something, eager, eager to pay our debt. How unusual is that and how profound? In book four of The Prelude, William Wordsworth writes to his friend about a sunrise. He writes to his friend, ah, exclamation point. I love that moment in poetry, ah, exclamation point. That sound, that inarticulation, indication of the good stuff, ah. Need I say, dear friend, that to the brim my heart was full? I made no vows, but vows were then made for me, that I should be, else sinning greatly, a dedicated spirit. On I walked in thankful blessedness, which yet survives. Mm, mm, mm. I was also not supposed to make that sound, but it's true. It's real. It's life. It's reality. So what do we do in these moments of gratitude, these profound opportunities to feel good? I would like to propose that we move from me to we. How do we sustain this sensation of reality of gratitude? We expand our perspective and our priorities. We say that the purpose of our life is not just our own satisfaction. That's not enough. That's not realistic. We can do more than that. This concept, this rhyming phrase that I love, Actually, it's not my own. It comes from, it comes from this young man here. At, at 12 years old, uh, Craig Kielberger read about this young man here, Iqbal Masi in Pakistan. Iqbal was a child laborer that was freed and traveled the world telling everyone that children should have pens in their hands and not tools. His message was so clear and so successful that it damaged carpet sales, so that when he was back in his home country, Iqbal was shot and killed by the carpet mafia. At 12, Craig was appalled that this happened in the world, so he, so he tore out the paper and he came to class and he said, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, an inarticulation indication of the important stuff. I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do, but I know we need to do something. Who will, who will help? Eleven hands went up. And that group of 12, 12 year olds, 30 years later, has become the largest organization of youth helping youth through education. If some of you have heard of We Day, this is the Genesis story. This is an idea that we can do more than serve ourselves. This idea that we want to fight, fight for the freedom from disease, poverty, exploitation, absolutely, but also fight for the freedom from the idea that our own personal satisfaction is fulfilling or is enough. I'm a big passion, I am very passionate about practicality. So how do we live like this on a day-to-day -day basis? I would like to borrow a theory from 19th century, Konstantin Stanislavski. It's such a fun name. Konstantin Stanislavski had this theory to create character, to enhance who we are and what we are. We have to be very intentional about our objectives. He said, don't, don't try to make up emotion when you're creating a character on stage. Don't try to make up emotion. Pick attainable and specific objectives that you can achieve and allow the pursuit, the desire, the fight to achieve them that will give rise to emotion, that will give rise to your character. But it's, it's very, very important that you make the moment, the scene, specific and layered, so that at any time on stage, you can, you can slice through the objectives, like an objective cake, and say, in this scene, I'm trying to achieve this, because it influences what I'm trying to achieve in the act, which is what I'm trying to achieve in the play, in the life, and in the world of this character. 
This system can be applied directly to our life. Unfortunately, we often exist, operate, and achieve objectives at this level. Moment, hour, and week. Taxes, homework. If I can, I can, if I can achieve this objective in this moment, I can get to the end of the hour, which means I can get to the end of the weekend. Yes. If I do weekends right, I can get a vacation at the end of the year. So these, these four here, if we continue to operate at this level of objectives, this system means that our lives will be defined by our weekends and our vacations, and maybe, if we're lucky, by our, our retirement. We all have these people in our life that seem a little bit vague. The symptoms include neediness, anxiety, too many cookies. People that operate at these levels, the lower levels of objectives, that have not clarified what they are doing in their life and for the world. But it is those that do that clarify why the moment matters to their life objective, those people inspire. Those are the people that make history because they have decided that the, the things they do from moment to moment matter. On a practical level, filling up the gas tank, a bit of a chore. If we were to reorient it and say, I'm filling up the gas tank so that I can leave the car in the parking lot for my partner, so that they can arrive on work, to work on time, it's a small, small reevaluation of reality that reinforms why we do the things that we do. Suddenly, I become the spouse, the partner that I want to be by doing the same activity with a clearer sense of purpose. Don't, don't be Keanu Reeves. A good man works very hard that has many shows with vague objectives, right? We've seen the movies where he just, it's what? What is going on? We meet people in our lives like that. What? What is going on? Why, why so many cookies? Do you need help, little man? Don't be a Keanu Reeves, not just because it's more satisfying to not be, but because the world needs you to be more. The world needs you to be a legend, Mr. Wayne. Liam Neeson tells Bruce Wayne that if you dedicate yourself to an ideal, you become more than a man. You become more than who you are. I'm going to end with a confession. Last night, a friend of mine found out that I was, I was giving the talk today, and, and he said, uh, this is about to get a little offensive. And Oh, good, good start. Excellent. Thank you. Um, he said, you know what? They, they used to just have experts. But the, the quality is really kind of it's decreasing. Um, <laughs> and I was like, what's that? And he's like, well, I mean, you're, you're, you're giving a, a talk. I was like, all right, bud. Thanks. Excellent. Have a great day. Love you. Good, good, but he's right. I am not an expert, not at all. I've eaten too many cookies, made far too many more significant mistakes to pretend that I have earned any right to stand here and to speak. But what does excite me is that you can be that expert, that legend. Regardless of, of, of where you stand or sit or move on the political spectrum, I think we can all agree it's very, very hard for us to trust people right now because it seems like most of the people we know, most of the people that we're supposed to admire are pursuing their own objectives, their own agendas. And that's not what inspires us. That's not what, what built our nation, our country, or hope. We love people that work for something bigger than themselves. We love people that are infected and contagious and inspired by a reason and a purpose bigger than themselves. I am excited because Regardless of where you are in life or in school, that can be us. We can make that decision to be those kind of people. So let's, let's finally address it. Wherever you are in life, let's do it right now. Let's transfer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.